Okay, so we have Tara here, and um, Tara was hoping, I was hoping that you could bring some clarity as to what was going on with me based upon my tongue and, and that kind of thing. So we looked at your tongue, and it, I don't know if you're going to show your tongue, but that might be cool to do. Um, well, there's that too. Okay. You had the oh, good oh, close up picture you sent picture, me. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and we saw that, you know, based on your tongue, you, you clearly eat really well. And I could see that you'd been cleansing and quite pure in your dietary choices because you didn't have a lot of excess coating on the tongue. Um, you know, signs of a lot of dampness or thick coating are a sign of someone not eating things that are, are easy to digest or um, things that are just maybe not good for them. So it's creating an accumulation or a backlog. You didn't have that, but what you did have was some swelling of the tongue and some lack of coating and lack of coating was showing a deep deficiency. And then there's also this redness that was too red, right? Like even your lips right now are really red, which is also an extension of what's going on in your gut. So there's, there were a lot of signs of inflammation going on, um, which again is in your case, not stemming from necessarily just the gut. In your case, we were talking about um, that it's not always biochemical or physical what's causing inflammation or what's causing an imbalance. You know, sometimes it becomes, we physically don't feel well, or we feel a state of dis-ease or disease right? But we, but it might be stemming from another place. And often it is. And um, that could be energetic. That could be emotional. That could be, um, I even encounter things in my clients where it's like really deep spirit level stuff, like soul level stuff. Um, and when we can address those layers, then the biochemical and the structural can also recalibrate. So it's not always about just hitting what's happening in the gut or what's happening in the the physicality of a person. It's important that we acknowledge that we really are multi-layered beings and that these frequency levels, like we are like a musical instrument and we, we need to acknowledge that in, in the way that we live so that we can recognize the subtleties of how to fine tune. Yeah. And that, that's like, yeah, that's why I'm really happy you came on is because I feel like I have an understanding of physical health and I thought I was very healthy. And I was like, there is, I mean, cause this is, I'm, to be honest, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that I got sick because I preach so much about, you know, you got to be healthy in all these ways. And, and, and I could never get sick. You know, I do my cold showers every day and my breathing and my fruits and vegetables and all and my alkaline and all, you know, my spring water and all that shit. But yet I still get sick. So that's what I want you to try to explain yeah. to us is how these different late, you know, the energetic and emotional, even the soul level spiritual stuff. Okay. Literally break you down and make you ill. Yeah. Yeah. So it depends on what tradition we want to focus on, but I could do it from a couple of different angles, which is kind of fun to do. So I will. Um, one is in the East Indian tradition, they talk about samskaras. And there's this idea that, that in your life, you come in with a certain amount of life lessons that you come in with. So regardless of your family of origin, regardless of the events that take place in the story that unfolds in your life, there's going to be things that, that are going to happen because perhaps it's carried over from even other lifetime or other things that somehow you're, you as a soul, as a spirit have to be able to experience to gain the knowledge and the fulfillment of your deeper consciousness evolving, right? So that's one perspective that you can do everything perfectly, whatever that means, and you're still going to um, encounter these life lessons. You can't escape them. They are going to happen. <laughs> and when they happen, it just highlights where your samskaras are. It's like, oh, that's one of my samskaras. Okay. Life universe is showing me this so I can learn from this. And what you do with it is what matters. It's not the idea that you should be ashamed or feel bad, like I've done something wrong because it's happening, because that's so beyond anyone's control. But what you, can, what you can have some control over is your reactivity to it. And that is going to have a huge impact on how quickly you heal or how quickly you bounce back from something challenging. I think about this a lot with PTSD patients um, and people I work with who deal with big, deep trauma. Um, it's 
sometimes inescapable, you know, inescapable. Sometimes it's things that happen to them um, and then repeated things that layer, right? But again, it's it's how you approach it and how you approach that is also going to basically be a mirror of how you approach the transition later in life toward death, which in a lot of traditions say is really the big thing. Like, it's not just how are you going to live? It's like, how do you want to die <laughs> too? Because that also impacts potentially the next cycle, mm-hmm. wherever you're going. So, you know, many traditions talk about this, um, many. So another approach or perspective is Chinese medicine. And in Chinese traditions, there's the idea that you come in with Jing or life force and you have a certain amount of it. And some traditions believe that you only have a certain amount and that's it. And you better really take a care of it because once it w- runs out, poof, you're gone. Like that's it. Others say you can nourish and cultivate actually to a degree. So I like to believe that, you know, that we it's not just... It, finite, that maybe there is something infinite we could draw upon and we could go deeper with the nourishment of the Jing and replenish. And, um, and in that philosophy, uh, again, you know, Jing is life force and source energy that's beyond our personal identity or our personal ideas of how we should or shouldn't be or life should or shouldn't go. So it's going to play out like natural cycles do, like that we're going to have our own mini hurricanes. You know, we're going to have our own mini tornadoes in life and we can't control that, but we can, again, choose how we're going to meet that and transmute that in a way that's alchemical and beautiful and powerful. Hmm. So, so how does, uh, is there a way to explain how the diminishing of your, what are you calling it? Jing? Is that Mm -hmm. what you're calling it? Yeah how that can actual, actually lead to physical symptoms. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Um, I say it's funny, but uh, I think this is something maybe your audience can relate to, or many people. I have someone I'm treating right now who's in his 70s, right? From his early life through his 40s, he had so much sex, <laughs> like sex with so many people and so much. Like he lived in Colorado and lived in a ski resort area. And he had sex so much that now he's dealing with erectile dysfunction. Now he's dealing with prostate disorders. Now he's dealing with issues around heart imbalances. And it's absolutely correlated to Jing, according to the traditions of Chinese medicine. If you over ejaculate even, that is one of the ways that you can diminish Jing a lot. Mm. Um, It doesn't mean don't be sexual. It means learn how to cultivate these energies and use them to resurge and re-nourish your own system instead of just letting it out and and treating it like something you're expunging, right? Stop or, jacking off. Yeah. 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 No, that seriously. That's awful. I I uh, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. That's all. That's a whole a whole section of the internet is like semen retention and stuff, which yeah. I do my very best to practice. Yeah, I'm not saying, you know, some traditions say you should only ejaculate once every 30 days for this reason. I don't agree with that. I think more like once a week is a great idea just for, you know, and it's also pleasurable for you and your partner, someone, you and someone, <laughs> Mackenzie, you right. know, um, it's um, it's just one of those things where that in itself is a deep intimacy that you don't necessarily want to give up if you're a householder. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these traditions were based on people that were doing sacred practices, but a lot of them were monks. So if you're living a monk lifestyle, not ejaculating for 30 days would be normal because you don't even have a partner, right? Right. But if you put it in the context of being a householder, someone that lives with a family that wants to have a life in the world, then you have to reframe the context of that wisdom so that it suits the life of what we're living in now. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and so, oh man, so... (laughs) We could go down that road for a long time, I'm sure. But but the idea is that's one example. But it's an it's a potent example and one that I think a lot of people can maybe consider and work with, you know. The other is, you know, cultivation practices, yogic practices, qigong practices, tai chi practices, you know, um, certain martial arts. They're all designed to harness that chi or that prana, that life force, and to calibrate it and fine tune it. And if we do a daily practices, like you and I talked about the other day, yesterday, God, it feels like forever ago. Yeah. Um, yesterday, that if you start your day off without an, a sadhana, a spiritual practice, physical practices, mental spiritual practices, and the onset of your day, 
without doing that, like the rest of the day can be more chaotic. The world kind of pushes you around. Mm. But if you sync yourself up with universal consciousness and flow before you're meeting the external world in your day, it sets you up right. And then you're in a flow musically, harmonically, that's so different. And I hope you'll share about that because you were telling me before we started about that today. About, um, about so today, like today for you versus yesterday, right? When you yeah. did your practices. Yeah, I, I definitely will um, include that in the video. So that, so, you know, when you, so Tara was helping diagnose me with my problems, mm -hmm. just, just to give context, like, you know, I, you know, there's, I didn't see any point in going and seeing a doctor, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't need somebody to tell me, oh, you got this, you need to, you know, go rest or whatever, give me some pharmaceutical drug um, to, to mask the symptoms. I wanted to get to the root of what was right. happening with me. Yeah. And um, you and your mentor, what is his name? Dr. Steven Seitler is one of my mentors and certainly the one for Chinese medicine and homeopathy the most. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so you called me and you guys were able to realize things about me that you didn't even know about me yeah that were true yeah how did you do that how does that <laughs> that's a longer session <laughs> but there's ways that we can work with people even remotely and you know if i see your tongue and i know your symptomology and um i knew your circumstances so i feel like i, I could do an intake just knowing your circumstance mm -hmm. um but those factors all combined you know made it clear or what would be needed. You know, when I work with someone though, I'm working with various layers, like I said. So in your case, we decided to work with Bach flower remedies, homeopathics, and then um, ancient Chinese form formulas that were herbal. And all three of those were really important because they work on different layers. So the denser herbs work on a different layer energetically than say the homeopathics. Homeopathics work on a different frequency or energetic layer than the Bach flower remedies. Mm. So when you understand what's needed from somebody with someone, you work all those. And there's a way that he described it um, that I shared with you yesterday, where this principle in Chinese medicine goes back that you want to hit something with vectors. So you want it like you have a virus or you have a bacterial problem or even a pain syndrome. You want to work at it from different angles or vectors. And if you come at it from different vectors, then it's like, they say it's like a thousand knives, right? Like it hit, it, it like breaks up whatever the thing is. It can't survive it because it's so powerful. So instead of like one medicine or a prescription, right? right. It's like, we're going to hit these different dimensions and then all at once it can recalibrate what's needed. My doggy wants to go outside. <laughs> well, do you, so do you think that is uh, I know you got, you got places to be um, right. Soon. You, I have like you, three minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Shit. Okay. <laughs> um, fuck. Well now, now I'm thinking, okay, where do I want to go now? Um, <laughs> we can do more. I just have to stop for a client soon. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Um, well, shit. I, that really, uh, is I that... think I think we hit it. The other yeah. thing is for you, though, it wasn't just those things I could give you. Right. It's not just about taking something. And that's so important. I want people to get that we take things um, which are important because there's ritual involved in that. When you take something, even a food, that's a ritual. It's it's an experience. It's a relationship that you're doing with intention. Right. To feed or nourish yourself a certain way. But your sadhana, your daily practices, the way that you nourish yourself as a whole being like I said at the beginning of the day, that that's just as important as the things that I'm sending you in the mail. You right, know? right. And you told me that my, uh, it was not just my chi. You said it was another type of chi, my outer protective. Oh, wei chi. Yeah. Wei chi. Okay. And you said so that the the absence pretty much of that or the diminishing of that is what mm -hmm. opened me up to becoming yeah. physically sick. Yeah. So in Chinese medicine, there's different kinds of chi that are part of our overall uh, system, right? Like, like we're a whole, we're a whole system, like our own universe. Uh, no, we are our own universes right. and there's different layers of chi in that. So Jing is that deep seated life force, right? That fills us and penetrates from a deep rooted place. But the external layers of chi are called wei chi, W-E-I. And Jing is spelled J-I Jing. Wei chi is W-E-I. The wei chi is more external chi. And it's the chi that 
that is more uh, extended even beyond our physical body. That is like, um, think of it like an energetic vortex that is a protective shield. Mm -hmm. And when it's weak, it's said in ancient texts that pathogenics, pathogenic factors, environmental factors, energetic factors that are somehow not great for us are met more likely to penetrate us. They're more likely to enter into our field. And I mean, in, it's interesting because even in Chinese, like Japanese traditions of acupuncture even say that it's not even important to use the needle in the skin. Like you could even just get near the needle point and the energetic intention alone can be powerful enough. At least some of the teachers say that because our Wei Qi and our Qi levels are so powerful. And those, once you understand those systems, you can work with them in subtle body ways. It's so funny. We'll let you go. It was just so crazy because I refused to believe I was sick because my diet was so right. good. And I was, so then I started having all these, I thought my whole life was a lie. I was like, my, I don't know anything about health. Oh, my no. diet. See, and like, so I was like, I, I, I went out and bought steaks. I haven't had meat. I don't eat meat. And I went out and bought steak and deer meat. And I've been eating meat every day because I'm like, maybe I'm complete. Maybe I'm, I thought I had a deficiency in my body. Well, I do think you do. I do think you do from what I saw a, and from what you've shared. A nutritional deficiency? Well, I would say it's worth exploring that part of it too. Okay. Because when you have a lack of coding, there's a lack of substance. There's mm. a lack of, um, it's called yin deficiency on the tongue. Mm. So sometimes because blood and yin are very intimate in their relationships. And one of the things that nourishes blood is things like bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't throw out this idea of having meat. I, I Personally, I'd go probably more to bone marrow. <laughs> like get the bone marrows, get it and put it in a broth and and do it up with vegetables. That's more what the approach I would take yeah. because in fact, I'm doing it today um, because uh, you need the vegetables, you need the fats, you need the proteins. But um, that's where I'm at with it more than doing the actual big meats. You know? Gotcha. Good mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tara, we'll, we'll let you go. Thanks for enlightening us. Um, and we'll have to hop on again and do another one soon. We always have the best conversations. Absolutely. I want to say one more thing about that because I, I know it's a huge thing out there of like, but I'm vegetarian or I'm vegan and I don't want to take that approach. And I respect that. But I also want to say that consider that ancient traditions, thousands, thousands of years old, like Native Americans, Chinese traditions, East Indian traditions. If you go way back in Ayurveda, you go way back in Chinese medicine, even if the practitioners were not, if they were mainly vegetarian or vegan, when it came to medicinal use, they would use the bones. They would use the marrows because there are times that call for that kind of stuff when it's a health moment. Mm -hmm. So consider it like a potential short-lived medicine if that's better suited for someone as opposed to changing your entire lifestyle and your diet long-term. Yeah, that that's a, that's a good way to look at it. Because for me, I was like, well, fuck, I guess I got to start eating meat. Because like, I guess there's some merit to that because when I did feel myself crashing. I was like, the first place my mind went was maybe I need meat. Yeah. Well, and I, I always say to someone, we'll try it and see how you feel after you eat it. Because I've had vegetarians or vegans who are like emphatically not going to have their meat or their whatever. And then they had one, one thing of it and they went, oh my God, I feel like my body's needed that for 10 years. Right. Yeah. Like suddenly. So for some people that is what they, they do need to put some back in. And, you know, I don't know if I've shared this with you, but I did meet Da the Dalai Lama's chef, the cook, his cook, one of his cooks way back when I was in India in Dharamsala. And I asked him about the Dalai Lama's diet because I cared so much. I yeah. like that stuff. And um, and that was something he shared with me that there were times where like ethically he wanted to be vegetarian, but there were times where his body needed yak or his body needed the bones, you know? And so he would, he had to figure out how to calibrate that and also deal with that um, ethically right. in a way that could just feel acceptable. You know, and I think every single one of us have to do that. I'm not against having some animals for the sake of medical med medicinal use. I am against the the practices of how we're dealing with animals. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I would never eat. Yeah. I'm eating like, like I said, deer meat from New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. You know, responsibly raised stuff. Um, one final thought is, and I'm going to touch more on this uh, after the, after this portion of the video, but I have been diehard on Dr. Sebi, right? And his, 
I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. A little. Mm-hmm. So, you know, his his whole thesis isn't be vegetarian, be plant-based. His thesis is, he, he'll say this, what did God give black man in Africa? Is what, is what his thesis was yeah. on. What did God give the black man to eat in Africa? Now, this is one thing that no one ever talks about, but it's been looming in me for the last year. He doesn't talk about white people. He doesn't talk about anybody's diet other than black people. And <laughs> and my ancestors were eating very different things. My yes. ancestors were not eating mangoes and I'm yes. trying to live on mangoes. My ancestors didn't know what a mango was. They were eating hunting buff. You know, I'm Native American. Yeah. You know, yeah. my, my ancestors yeah. were hunting buffalo. It was all meat in their diet almost. You this know. is really significant, and I'm so glad you're bringing it up because I really believe in that above and beyond anything with even your blood, um, your blood AO or whatever. You know, I really believe like you got to consider the whole context of that human being. So I'm I come from roots that are like some Swedish, some Scottish, some German, like those right, those places in the world had a certain biochemical um, significant um uh, hand me down <laughs> into my cells, you know, like I, I ancestrally, I have some of that carried over in my cellular structure, you know, the things they were eating, like that's real. Right. And to ignore that or deny that to me doesn't make sense. It's ludicrous <laughs> because we have to consider that that's part of our biochemistry and part of our real absolute makeup. Now we don't want to just rely on that, but absolutely, you know, we're, cause we are evolving creatures. Right. So we don't want to just rely on that, but we do want to consider it. It has a, it has a place in this right. conversation. Always. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, Cause you know, as much as I love the whole Dr. Sebi thing, there's always been this thought in the back of my head and, and this whole situation really kind of validated that for me that like, I, cause I do feel like I'm actually as healthy as my diet is. I am nutritionally deficient in some way because I have my that's just not my my ancestors didn't even know what a mango was. And I'm you also have to consider where you live. You also because right now you're in Ohio and it's very cold. Mangoes yeah. could not survive that. So why do you think your body could survive on mangoes? That's very true. <laughs> that's, very, <laughs> that's very true. And these are all things to consider. And it's I'm I'm happy that I'm taking it seriously now and, and looking at it from that way, because it's a major revelation for me. It's like a mm. shift switches when you think about it in these ways. Yeah. I love that. I'm so happy to be part of that. <laughs> well, thanks for everything. And uh, we'll, we'll chat soon. I know you got another call to get on to. I better, but I'm happy to have time with you always, awesome. always, always. Love you, Tara. <laughs> love you too, Jarrett. See, See you ya. soon. Bye, honey. Bye.